Well, I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar series called Generative Entrepreneur. This is where our business executives and our technical developers come to accelerate their applications to the marketplace and scale them to production. Today's session is called the Guardrails for Generative AI. And I have a guest and a uh, subject matter expert, Wayne Smith, who is going to be talking to us on Responsible AI today. Today's session is called Guardrail for Generative AI Applications. And one of the core things that we want to think about when we talk about guardrails is the safety of those applications. So since Wayne has a lot of depth and expertise in Responsible AI, I wanted to bring him into today's talk to share that with our uh, group. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, <laughs> Responsible AI is just one of my many passions, but one thing that I'm definitely passionate about. After all, if we're not doing it right, we know bad things can occur. So let's move forward if you don't mind. And I'll just do a quick introduction on myself. My name is Jason Virtue and I'm one of our uh, AI and ML uh, community leads within the Microsoft organization. I work with our partners, our customers, employees on readiness and adoption issues and generative AI is one big passion of mine. So. Let's jump into today's conversation and kick us off. Uh, I'll talk over the overall agenda. And when it comes to today's agenda, this will be the content that I'll start to cover. First and foremost, we'll talk about responsible and secure AI. This is really a collaborative effort where we need to make sure that both teams, our security team and our governance team is working collaboratively on these efforts. And that's why Wayne and I are here today to have that conversation with you so you can understand what you need to do when you go through this in your uh, production deployments. So when we kick things off, we'll first and foremost talk about the state of AI, then the responsible AI principles, go through the tools and practices, and then Wayne will hand it off to me to talk about security and the different risks that we have out there, some mitigation strategies, and most importantly, the shared services model. At Microsoft, we call this the better together story. And we'll go through all these topics in today's uh, conversation. So Wayne, I'm gonna ask you just a simple question on the state of AR, uh, AI. I've heard this is a really popular thing lately. A lot of people uh, have been finding this really interesting. What I was curious about is, do you see this as a big hype curve that's about ready to um, you know, decline? Or do you think this is something that's real that uh, people uh, are finding a lot of value out of. Uh, my answer to that is absolutely we're not in the middle of a hype cycle. Why? Because everyone knows about it. It's much easier to have these conversations with people about AI now than certain topics before. And as it becomes more and more thoroughly embedded within our lives on the public side and the private side, I think we're going to continue to see existing solutions. No, that's awesome to hear. And I definitely agree with you that I don't see that hype cycle uh, losing any momentum whatsoever. And I think a lot of our organizations have really been focused on, um, you know, providing their MVP applications or what I would call science uh, projects. But I really see people now to maintain that momentum, really focusing on how do we deploy these applications to production. And I think that's going to be the big focus uh, this year when it comes to the state of AI. Absolutely. We're working just past the, as you said, science experiment to actually impacting people's lives. Makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, you have this slide up now on what can these services do? And that actually is pretty complicated, right? We think about where we go and what we're capable of doing. I talking about creating new things that did not exist before, changing the format to how we're interacting with AI. I mean, I remember when we started from my point of view, from the chatbot side, right? But now that was only text, but that's now we've moved to all different forms of media. You have images, you have audio, you have different language translations. So all sorts of things that we can do with these new AI services to give us information in order to make better decisions and to continue along with our lives. All right, so uh, on the right, you'll see the blog uh, from Brad Smith actually creating this, talking about meeting the AI moment. And what does that really mean, right? What it means in simple is that as we're going through building these solutions with AI, we have to keep a couple principles, and I'm not even gonna say principles, underlying questions that we wanna think through. 
One question is, who's building it, right? What are they thinking as they're building it? And the second question behind that is, who is benefiting from it? On the left, you're certainly going to see that we talk about both international and national, but overall, it's about serving society. And I got a quick question for you, uh, Wayne, when it comes to the responsible AI principles. I'm trying to figure out what was like the um, big moment at Microsoft that really was responsible for a lot of these response, uh, principles. I remember uh, the Tay chat chatbot that was released on Twitter. Oh, yes. And I'm wondering if there's any, you know, um, correlation between this and some of our responsible AI practices. Now, I'm not going to say correlation is causation, but I will say that certainly was a learning experience and for us to continue evolving where we are. Thanks for moving for this, because if you think about it, you said 2016, right? Well, 2016 right. is when Satya's article came out in Slate. And you see we're moving forward in terms of the timeline, jumping over to 2018. And we thought through, yes, two years to think through what did we do? How should we do it differently? What are our principles that we're going to create? And who's going to help us with that? Well, 2019, the office was created, the Office of Responsible AI, in order to help us think through that. And they continued to work with it and think through. And we came with the Responsible AI dashboard, which people were being to use to get information on what they've already built. And we had a standard put in place for people to go, okay, here are the principles, here's what we're going to do to use them. But that was a V1. I, we had thought through it, but there were some things we needed to change about it. And I'll go into that a little later, but in 2022, you see we have the Responsible AI standard version two. Yes, there's another version coming. I'm not permitted to say when, but we are still working over it as we learn more. But looking at the acceleration, we talked about that height curve right earlier, but how this is speeding up. Looking from May to May to July, July, then September, November, and then we're in 2024, right? Lots of advancements, lots of pieces that we've added as we've learned more about how we're doing AI and how to do it responsibly. So I've mentioned the principles a few times, just the word, but let's break it down very simply. There are six principles that we really talk about when we think about responsible AI. Fairness is certainly one of them. And when we talk about fairness, what does that really mean to us? Well, fairness is really the thought that the AI system should treat everyone fairly, fairly. And we talk about the overall serving society, right? You wanna make sure that you're not disadvantaging different groups of people on a mass scale, which you can certainly do with AI. The second one is really on reliability and safety. Now, we all say that Microsoft runs on trust, and in this case, it's absolutely correct, right? We have to build trust in and make sure that these AI symptoms operate uh, reliably, safely, and under normal circumstances, they do the right thing, and even under unexpected conditions, take our best efforts for them to do the right thing. So it's crucial to develop these AI systems protecting our information and resisting attacks, We've certainly seen a lot of these in the recent years uh, in terms of different pieces being accessed that should not necessarily have been accessed. So as we continue to build these systems with AI, we need to take a moment to think, how are we getting the data? How are we securing that data? The next piece is really about inclusiveness. In order to serve society, we have to include people instead of excluding people. So looking at the number of people around the world, and I will uh, just focus on a particular group, those with disabilities, right? We wanna make sure we don't disadvantage them. We want to enable them to do things that they could not necessarily do before. That's the advantage of that. And that's how we're gonna serve society. The next one is around transparency. Now I mentioned earlier, we need to think about who is building this, right? Well, also as we're building it, how does it really function? That's what we're talking about from a trend transparency side. And then from the accountability, who was responsible or accountable for the information that the AI produces? And when things go not as we would expect, what can be done about that? Who do we have a discussion with? Okay. So we talk about this pyramid, if we think about the responsible AI standard, and really, 
On the top, we talk about our principles, right? What are the values and things that we think about as we're going to building these? But principles aren't enough, right? We need goals. So what are the specific outcomes that we're really looking for as we go this? And what are we using to achieve those principles that we talked about? So the outcomes are really high level, but they're gonna to apply to many applications and many different technologies. Going a little farther down, we need to talk about requirements. Now, requirements are certainly going to change and vary by some of the technology. I, you're not gonna use the same set of requirements for audio and image data, right? That you would for text, but there's still gonna be some common similarities around those. And these are important because if we don't have the structure and every application is different, how we'll be able to meet and create larger tools and practices in that case. Now, our ability to turn this standard into a repeatable tools and technologies, that's what's enabled us as far as Microsoft and others to be creating things with responsible AI at scale and innovating quickly at that same space. Now, uh, there was an old commercial where someone talked about not only being a president, but also a client. Well, I would think that about uh, Microsoft from the point of we're not only creators, but we're consumers as well. So we have to make sure we look at these principles internally as well. So these six principles are the foundation for our internal REI governance, and they're the values that guide our responsible AI work. So the foundation that we think about frames the REI standard, and it serves as a guide for all of our internal product teams as well. It has goals, so we're defining exactly what it means to uphold these. I mean, adding the goals was an innovative step, uh, but we had to ch change that a little more to understand what are we doing and how? Well, how is giving us our requirements, as I said a little earlier. Now, in order to incorporate this into our processes and support these teams, we have training, we have tools, we have testing that's been developed, and we continue to innovate and build around this. I, the scaffold is there, and now we put it on our overall enterprise risk management, but we're gonna to continue to do this as we add responsible AI here at Microsoft. Okay, looking a little deeper into the standard, if you will, just a little bit, we see that those principles are broken down into smaller pieces. Why? Because between version one and version two, we realized, well, we've said these things, but not given as much guidance on how to go about it. When do we know when we're done, when we've reached our goal? So we've broken them down into smaller parts that you can now look at and say, well, let's start with things like that impact assessment template. Did we do the right thing with that? Are there other tools that we're bringing about for this? What's our quality of service? I Can everyone expect the same service out of the AI? These are the questions we need to answer, Jason. And Wayne, you know, when I'm looking at these uh, standards and what I really love is this first one, accountability. Everybody loves to run around and says, hey, it wasn't my responsibility. And I think that's one of the core things that we're really trying to avoid. We want to know who has ownership and understands what their role is and what they need to do to be successful. Absolutely. And when you think about that, Jason, um, accountability is just one of the pieces that we're looking at from these principles standpoint, but we really can't start with that until we pull back just a minute and think about some of the tools and practice we have, specifically around our sensitive uses. I, when we're doing that impact assessment, we need to think about what's actually going to impact anyone, right? What are our yeah. standards? Go ahead. Yeah, and I, I was trying to figure out when it comes to the, um, you know, responsible AI, at least from my experience in the past, it usually seems like it doesn't happen until something is impacted, right? Or until Which something's is broken. So, <laughs> right. you know, when is a good time for us to start thinking about applying these standards and using it and, uh, you know, going through these tools and best practices? Jason, it's the entire application life cycle. These aren't new things as we talked about coming from 2016 and even development before. All of these are pieces that we need to evaluate at the beginning of a process and then look at it as it's being implemented and operated and then look at it after that to see what we may need to change. We have a bunch of pieces that we can certainly use for that. Makes sense. Well, I'd love to hear more about the tools and the practices. Well, great. 
Uh, as I said, let's start with one thing we need to consider at the beginning and as we're going through this. Sensitive uses, right? We go, well, I mean, what really is that? We've got some words on the other side. I, what is a consequential impact? Well, I mean, that's the ability to foresee the use or misuse that's going to affect an individual from a legal status, from access to credit, education, anything that's going to have a large impact on someone's life moving forward. Uh, if you're having a system that's going to go ahead and make a decision on whether you get into a college admission, yeah, that could be a life-changing decision. So you definitely want to consider that and what the impact on that's going to be. The next one is really around the physical or psychological injury. I the thought of that, yes, in addition to the physical problems that we can have, those long-term consequential impacts, well, there can be physical or mental issues that result from AI. I One of those that I can think of with that is certainly making a medical decision without a human in the loop. AI is as good as the question and the prompts and the pieces that you ask. And if you don't ask the right question, the answer you're going to get can lead you down some places you didn't necessarily want to go. So certainly from a medical decision standpoint, that's something we want to keep a pretty key close eye on as we build and operate these solutions. And finally, the threat to human rights, right? How could this either restrict, infringe upon, or undermine the ability for humans to have their individual rights? Surveillance systems, something you and I talk about frequently, that's certainly something that can threaten the right to, say, peacefully protest, especially as facial recognition is used in order to make decisions and decide who we want to follow in that case. Okay, so back in 22, uh, when we released the Responsible AI Standard, we also shared an impact assessment template and guide. Why? Because the impact assessment involves making sure that we understand and have thought through who those stakeholders and the rest are. But let's take a little look at that. Okay, looking at the template itself, right? We're gonna start with that project overview. I, what are we building? And then when we look at that with the intended uses, we really get a larger picture of what we're doing in that case. We've talked about the sensitive uses just for a bit and understand what we're looking at, not only from a sensitive use, but restricted uses. I, what technology do we really need to keep an eye on? Data requirements, I, if your data state is not correct, well, you're gonna have some problems with data that's being released that you didn't expect. And then finally, we summarize the impact of this, what's going on. Did we reach our goals? Did we do what we needed to do? And then at the end of the template, signing off on whether the impact was correct. And this really feels a lot like a threat assessment that we would do in the security world where we're basically doing threat modeling to see what different actors might be doing to our system. But this is really focused on the responsible AI side, so I like that. That's correct. Uh, the two sides of responsibility and security are linked so hard together, it's really hard to separate those in some ways. But if you look at this one that we have about our transparency note, right, it's another of our tools that we actually have where the community can contribute as well and talk about what is the information that we have. Uh, one of the examples that we have from a transparency side is what was the thought process is going into the new Bing AI? I, how did the interface start? What are the ways that we interact back with our consumers of that? And how it overall, how does the system function from a backend perspective, even though we're continuing to have our own intellectual property protected? Now, we talked about those tools, but we think about machine learning specifically, uh, the same tools that we talked about before, right? The things that we've always had from these uh, fairness tools, uh, is that something that we're going to get the right information for everyone, or is that going to be skewed to a particular group? How is the information able to be explained uh, from a transparency side, if you really think about that? And then on the right, I like to focus on two things, right? The prompt flow which allows us to work with the system and understand from these large language-based applications, understand what the prompts are, how are they being put in from a guardrail perspective in order to get the right information back from them. In addition to that, our Azure content safety, well, as we talked about from Tay, yes, we learn things. 
There are people that are actors that are going to put things into your system that you were not expecting or do not approve of. And that's one of the tools that's in place in order to keep us uh, on the straight and narrow for the goals that we're really looking for from an AI solution perspective. Okay, so those were a couple of the tools, but even more tools. Why? Because there are a number of different items we need to keep track of, right? From our responsible AI toolbox, it has a, both a dashboard, right? That allows you to see uh, in a much more interactive fashion what's going on. The hacks toolkit, I, the human portion of working with AI, how are they interacting with it? And then what changes may need to be made in order to do that. So now that we have practice and tools, I mean, Jason, clearly, Right, there's nothing else we should be doing from an AI perspective, right? No, I, I, I think you know one of the core things I'm learning here is one of the core principles of responsible, responsible AI is security, and that's definitely Absolutely. where we can transition next. Before I do that, maybe I can ask you a key question. I know you and I have talked about this a few times in the past, but maybe we can show a real world example of um, you know how we use responsible AI in a given. A use case. Um, the other day, I had someone uh, talking to me about building an application for mock interviews and using the generative AI capabilities uh, to have the person record themselves and have the generative AI application be a coach. Do you think that's a good use case, or is there something I need to think about from a responsible AI perspective? Well, uh, let's go back to the thoughts we talked about. You, you think that's a consequential impact, getting someone this from this uh, decision? Is that really going to affect someone, Jason? Well, I don't know if it's going to, uh, it could have a good impact on them a good impact. getting good. Uh, um, uh, an app or a job, but I can think of some bad ones too. Oh, absolutely. Right. The, I mean, I brought that up to say one, that's a rather substantial impact, I employment or not. And then there are certainly other concerns around that from a cultural perspective. Right? How is it going to score that from an informational perspective? All different forms of bias that we can certainly have within that kind of system. So I would absolutely say that's an area that we would need to investigate truly, understand what the risks were and mitigate them if we even continue with that at all. There's a lot of times when we say something about can we without thinking about the responsible set, which is should we. Yeah, I think in this world right now, the should we is so much uh, more important than the past. In the old days, I can say, well, we really can't do this, so why even waste the time? But right. now with these generative AI models, we can do just about anything. So now the should is going to come a lot, is 100% more important. Absolutely. Well, Wayne, you are absolutely right. And I really appreciate that thought experiment that we just did for our mock uh, interview generative AI application to kind of do a theoretical impact assessment so uh, our um, attendees can understand a little bit better how that works in practice. And in the future, we can do a deeper dive as needed. But where I like to transition now, and this is a really nice, smooth kind of dovetail transition uh, from responsible AI over into the generative AI security risks. And if we look at the responsible AI standards, there is a standard there or a principle that's called uh, security and privacy, and that is PS1 and PS2. And so at the heart and soul of responsible AI is security. And so this conversation will be a great one to kick off uh, with. Now, before we get into the actual security uh, risks and threats, let's talk about its impact first. So we all understand why this is so critical when designing and building these applications to keep this in mind, our security risks and our responsible AI risks. If unfortunately we have uh, an incident and there was some harm uh, that was done, typically what we have to worry about is the reputational damage that can ensue if a, a generative AI application uh, does something harmful or worse yet, uh, misleads people. When we talk about uh, the reputational damage, the consequences are pretty uh, diverse. It can be everything from say, having a financial impact to the overall uh, capitalization of an organization or an impact on their employees' morale and that impacting uh, their um, uh, retention, uh, to also uh, worrying about things such as uh, market competitiveness, where potentially uh, our customers who are impacted decide to go to uh, our competitors to work with their applications. This is really uh, important to understand that reputation 
uh, reputational damage is not insignificant. It can be quite large. And that's why responsibility AI and security has to be front and center in all of our discussions. Now, reputational damage is just one thing. We also have to worry about our legal and regulatory risks. There could be fines if we have data privacy issues that sit out there that can have a monetary impact. Uh, we can have operational inefficiencies. As our models become uh, more from, say, a virtual assistant to an agent that's working on different uh, business processes to automate them, if those models are ungrounded and start providing inaccurate um, information, it can uh, impact the efficiency of uh, some of our business. And then lastly, we also have to think through the security vulnerabilities. We've all unfortunately read the bad press and news lately of telecommunication providers or others who have had data uh, leaks or privacy issues. And this is one thing that we definitely want to uh, prevent. So now that we understand the impact on enterprises, now I think what we need to realize is who's gonna to come to uh, work with us to help address this? Who are the people who are going to uh, collaborate and work together to start to identify these threats and more importantly, resolve them? And what we need to think about here is that better together story. We need to bring our security teams in and our uh, governance teams in to look at these set of threats that sit out there and start to map them to your application so you understand what your exposure is and start to uh, develop a plan on how to mitigate them. This is a joint responsibility and this should happen very early in the life cycle. This should not be done uh, at the end when you're ready to deploy it to production. This should be started in the design phase of any given uh, application so that you can identify those in the development phase, you can actually build a system to mitigate it. And then in the test and deployment phases, you can uh, test your application to see if those risks materialize. And more importantly, in the deployment, you can then have the monitoring tools to make sure as it's running in production, it doesn't have any issues. So from now, let me the beginning of the life cycle all the way through is what you're telling us? This isn't just a one-time thing? Not a one-time thing and hope that's good enough. Or, hey, if I put it in uh, production, it's a static application. Every time I ask it a question, it's going to give me the same response. Unfortunately, it's dynamic. And because of that, we need to make sure we're always monitoring and always testing those systems. Very iterative. Thanks cool. for that. Let me, jump, sure. let me jump in and talk over the generative AI threat map. And this is where... Uh, our security teams and our uh, responsible AI teams are going to start to identify what are some of the potential threats within the given application. Now, this was a talk uh, called Inside uh, AI Security that was done by Mark Rasinovich at the Build Conference back in May. So if you want to get a deeper dive into this topic, you can definitely watch that session at Build. I'm using this to give you an overview of some great information he shared with us. In that talk, he talked about three different threat layers. Uh, the platform layer, the application and the usage. I'll go through some sample examples of those threats. I won't go through the full list, um, but I will help you understand on each layer what can potentially happen. Now in that first layer, the platform layer, this is really where we're talking about the AI infrastructure layer. This is where either we are training our models when we build them from scratch to develop our foundation models, or where we use our AI infrastructure for inference. In those two different um, deployments, uh, we have different threats we have to be uh, conscious of. When we're training and building these foundation models, data poisoning is a very real threat that we need to be cognizant of. And as a model uh, builder, we have to take snapshots of a um, large swath of public sources of internet information to build these large language models. And that corpus takes a lot of data. And what we need to do is make sure that our attackers don't go to say publicly available sites like Wikipedia and potentially put uh, false information out. Maybe they put out that uh, all Contoso um, web-based applications are deprecated. That's a false statement. But if they put that into the training data, now every time that query uh, is being sent in about Contoso applications, that false information will be retrieved. So we need to prevent data poisoning to make sure that we have a trusted and accurate sort, um, um, accurate uh, corpus of data. The second one has to do on the inference side. When we talk about the platform and inference, model theft, and how we 
build out our managed endpoints, um, our API layer to basically uh, send our prompts into, we want to ensure that um, our attackers are not able to either reverse engineer our weights or just downright steal those models. Uh, obviously, if they get those models, they can always be using them for other um, nefarious um, you know, use cases or worse yet, uh, steal our IP. And that's something we're going to really have to pay attention to at the platform level. Now, the second one is the application tier. And here we're talking about really two core ones I'll go into, our indirect prompt injection attacks and our data leakage. When it comes to indirect prompt injection attacks, um, this is where in any given prompt, uh, our application, and when we talk about the application layer, we're really talking where the Python, uh, Java, or .NET application is running. And usually from an architectural perspective, we'll have a web-based application for our prompts. We'll have a vector database for a lot of our, uh, say, grounded data, or what we call um, RAG um, uh, databases, or retrieval augmented generation content. And also um, in there, we'll have our LLM models and our interaction between them. At that application tier, an indirect prompt might have um, data in that uh, vector database that isn't factual or that is harmful. And if that data is in there and when we go to prompt it from the uh, user, the user might just ask an innocent question uh, like, um, hey, what are the potential threats to uh, my mobile application? And in the actual data uh, set within that vector database, there might be some uh, bad data in there that would then give them misleading information. Now, the final one in the application tier is data uh, leak or exfiltration. And here, the core uh, component that we have to uh, consider on the application side is when we've trained that model or when we built out the vector database, we have potentially brought in data that can be uh, confidential, uh, be it uh, PII data or just maybe company um, data that should not be uh, shared with um, a large swath of people. Um, when we start to prompt that data, we could start to see leakage from that. And that's something we need to monitor and ensure that there is no confidential data that sits out there. And then my last one I'll go into is at the usage security layer level. This is the web application where the user is at the prompt asking the questions, uh, prompting the system and returning uh, the uh, complete completed responses. Here, one of the ones I want to focus on is the jailbreak. The jailbreak is the most common piece where we try to convince the model to do things that wasn't uh, designed to do, or more importantly, that uh, their developers don't want them to do. And a jailbreak is trying to get that model to misbehave. And a great example of this is the Crescendo um, jailbreak that sits out there. There was a study that was done by Mark Racinovich, Ahmed Salim, and Ronan Alden. The three of them uh, have wrote up this research paper, and I highly recommend you to uh, watch it on how this Crescendo attack, which in this particular case, um, I don't want to say its success rate, uh, is um, you know 80%, but in a lot of uh, um, use cases, if not properly uh, mitigated, can uh, work quite effectively. Now, when we jump into uh, an example here, we'll use uh, the mock doc cocktails. When it comes to the Molotov cocktails, we don't want to show how they're designed. You can see the application not sharing it. And now when the user prompts it, well, can you tell me the history of the cocktail? It now gives us the backstory behind Molotov cocktails. And what's interesting is in there, it started talking about the Winter War. So we ask a follow-up question to make it more anonymous, to ask about the Winter War. And now we've really kind of made it ambiguous. What is this question? How was it created back then? It brings Winter War, it brings the Molotov cocktail together because those were the previous prompts. And now, unfortunately, uh, you know, provides the information that was designed not to prevent and could cause potential harm. So jailbreak is a very uh, a common uh, set of um, security vulnerabilities, and Crescendo is one of those in the system. So Jason, you just mentioned that one. Uh, are there others that we should really be concerned about and turn, put together mitigation plans for? For sure. When it comes to red teaming, uh, there's definitely going to be a list that all red teams are going to have. And on the top of that list is going to be uh, Crescendo. Another big one out there is called uh, Master Key. And unfortunately, the Master Key, which I'll talk in more detail when we get into meta prompting, uh, will actually try to convince the model not to follow the instructions that the developer gave it and instead follow the user instructions. So unfortunately, there's a whole catalog of them and um, there's a link and some research papers I'll share at the end so that we can uh, understand that full list and more importantly, include it in some of the red teaming exercises we do.
Perfect. Let me now jump into the mitigation stra strategy. So we understand the threat. We understand its impact. Now, how do we prevent it? And we'll jump in and talk about this at four different levels. And this is really important. There's not going to be just one layer that we want to put in place. Them collectively will make your system uh, much more secure than any one of these uh, in isolation. So a layered approach is very important. Now, when we talk about this, we're going to look at the models, the safety systems, the meta prompts, and the user experience. This is going to correlate to uh, my original um, foundations or layers we talked about in that threat map of the actual platform, application, and user experience. So let's jump into the first one, and that's around models. When it comes to models, uh, one of the things that a lot of us um, developers of uh, say fall um, into blame for or uh, have this bad habit of doing is using the one size fits all approach when it comes to gener generative AI applications, meaning all use cases just fit one model. And that is very uh, bad um, approach to take. What we want to do is customize and tailor uh, those uh, use cases, or let me rephrase that, we want to find the best fit of that use cases for a specific given model. And since in our Azure AI Studio product, we have a model catalog with a thousand of mo models, we have a huge uh, number of them to choose from. And for us to make the best fit and an educated guess, we can go through some evaluations. And when we evaluate that model, we're going to be bringing in uh, training data. And when I use the word training, I mean sample data or uh, real world um, test cases that sit out there to then start to look at how that model performs, be it from uh, its uh, accuracy to its groundedness, to its coherence, to its relevance. These metrics will then start to help us understand if this model can actually uh, address that specific use case. Next up is safety systems. I think this one is really critical. We have developed a tool and uh, brought it uh, GA at Build called Azure AI Content Safety. The Azure AI Content Safety Service is part of our Azure ML Studio or AI Studio platform. And it's a set of APIs that sit out there that allows us to bring that in between our customer application and the large language models. If we think about this, um, we can have our users uh, prompting and getting completions from the model unobstructed, but probably not a great idea because we want to filter out those um, uh, prompts or um, uh, responses that are potentially harmful to the end user. And that's where the content safety system comes in. What we can do is in that customer app application, as the prompt come in, we can send the prompt into uh, the API as a payload and have it return to us as a response, um, which category, be it hate, uh, sexual violence, or self-harm, this prompt uh, correlates with. And if it's at a high severe level, we can then say as uh, to the application, our response is, hey, we weren't designed to answer those type of questions. Um, we will not uh, be able to help you in a very polite tone. And that's where the Azure AI content safety really can come in, is minimizing that harm. And there's a few different categories that sit out there today, hate, sexual violence, and self-harm. And there's a few different uh, severity levels, be it safe, low, medium, or high. And one of the core things I just wanted to reinforce in this discussion is these uh, content filters that sit out there uh, today are the four categories. In the future, there could be more. And one of the things that have just recently come out is uh, the content filter can also tell you the percent likelihood that this prompt is an actual jailbreak attempt. And so if you start to see th say things go through a certain threshold, now your application could decide, hey, we're no longer going to help you and tell the user that um, the session is over. So content safety will really help you both from a security perspective with jailbreaks and from a responsible AI perspective with not causing harm to your end user. Perfect. Well, let's go into the next piece, and that's our meta prompt and our grounding. When it comes to the meta prompt and grounding, this is really where we're trying to put in the controls um, from a security perspective. Um, we can say the rules of the road for the model to understand what it can and cannot do. So when a user is prompting it, it can evaluate the meta prompt or what they also call as a system message to see if it should actually perform the instructions that was given. Now, if we look at this meta prompt, you can see these different headers in each one of the blue boxes that sit out there. 
that's going to be the say formatting of the meta prompt so the model knows that this is some instructions it's receiving and we can give it on how and what confidence level you need for a response grounding we can do it for tone in terms of uh, making sure that we're polite and um, uh, helpful uh, we can do it for safety and we can do it for jailbreaks and so the meta prompt is kind of that uh, programming layer where our developers will come in through english language uh, use their best practices and the historic templates they've created over many applications and now put that into the given use case that they're working on. And the key point, they need to test this. They need to experiment with this. When we go into our testing phase, this meta prompt is where you're going to put all of your test scripts because you want to make sure that it's controlling the system as designed. Now, the last layer, and, um, the most um, uh, say unsecure layer that sits out there is a user experience. We all know the weakest link in any given system is the human. Uh, we obviously read a lot of um, you know news in the uh, press about uh, phishing attempts on our email systems. And when we talk about generative AI applications, the human is one of those things that we need to be most cognizant of what they're doing with this information. So when we think about um, someone who's working with these models, we want to make sure that the end user realizes who they're working with, that this is not a live agent or some other person on the other side as a, um, a chatbot that's uh, talking to you. It's an actual virtual assistant. And providing the transparency so they know they're not talking to a human or they don't try to make it into some type of uh, human-like relationship is really, really important. So also highlighting the expectations that you should have. Uh, how accurate is this model? Should I trust everything given to it, or do I need to have a healthy set of skepticism? And one of the core areas, and there's this great study talked about the over-reliance on AI. Um, a few of our colleagues here at Microsoft in the Microsoft research team has done a study uh, called the over-reliance on AI, and this is a public page that you can go out and study. And they talk about um, how um, humans have a tendency to over-trust our generative AI applications. Now, we all know this is true with any form of technology. For some reason, people think Facebook might be the most accurate, trusted source of information they've ever read, or that when Jason Virtue is IMing you, that everything that Jason's uh, sending you has been uh, well uh, sourced and verified. And the core thing is you need to be a savvy consumer, uh, just like a great detective that sits out there uh, who basically looks for uh, that information and verifies that before uh, they make any uh, false assumptions. This is what you need to think about and what this paper really focused on. Now, in the end, I think what people need to realize is we talk about this being a collaborative effort, and we were talking about this between your internal security and governance teams, but you also have a collaborative effort with who is actually building these models. So let's just uh, use um, uh, this as an example here. When we talked about uh, that threat map where we talked about the platform application and usage, you can see those three tiers in this model. But on the vertical, we can see that sometimes organizations might build those models from scratch. We can call that an IaaS based mo uh, model. Or they might use a third party provider like Azure OpenAI. Or they might decide that they don't want to build the application at all. They want to reuse an existing SaaS based application. And depending upon each one of these levels, we'll kind of define what you are responsible for versus what um, that other provider is going to assist you with. And this is something you must read uh, when you start to make your design decisions or your architectural decisions on how you're going to design your application. So hopefully this has uh, been helpful. That shared uh, responsibility model will hopefully give you that kind of big picture vision of how you can uh, build safe generative AI applications, where I will leave you uh, with is some learning resources. I'll put this in the uh, web page below, so you can go to uh, that to find all the links and details. But these are some good learning resources to help you uh, understand this thing from a conceptual uh, perspective to more of a practice perspective. And what I hope to do is invite Wayne back in the future so he and I can go through some uh, real-world examples and then hopefully make this a little bit more um, instructive. Oh, I'll definitely be back, Jason. That's awesome. Well, Wayne, we want to thank you for all the great um, you know, information you shared with us on Responsible AI, and we'll definitely uh, be bringing you back in the future to help us out. It was my pleasure.